Welcome to NMR video part 3. Let's first talk about the effect of molecular structure on chemical shift. Protons in a molecule that are of the same type, that is all primary, all secondary, or all tertiary, that are in similar molecular environments tend to have similar chemical shifts, that is similar delta values. Conveniently, these values are available in tables. You'll find such tables in the packet on NMR that's posted on Blackboard. There's also a table in your textbook, and you can also find such tables posted on various websites on the net. Let's look at the tables posted in your packet. The first table is 10.2. This table lists average chemical shifts of aliphatic protons. These include methyl protons, methylene protons, and methine protons. The next table is table 10.4. This table gives average chemical shifts of protons attached to unsaturated carbons. This includes alkene groups, alkyne groups, carbonyl, groups and aromatic groups. That's represented in the by this entry, the symbol AR is an abbreviation for aromatic. The next table is table 10.5. This table gives average chemical shifts of protons bonded to heteroatom elements, including nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. Now going back to table 10.2, let's first look at methyl protons. Methyl protons attached to a saturated hydrocarbon group, that is alkyl group, exhibit delta values in the range of 0.8 to 1.2. Now all the other entries, the methyl group is attached to different groups. You'll note that all these other values are larger than the value where methyl is attached to an alkyl group. And that's because all the other groups relative to an alkyl are electron withdrawing. Electron withdrawal reduces the density of the electron cloud surrounding the methyl protons. This causes the frequency of the proton spin to increase. This results in a greater value of the observed chemical shift, that is greater delta value. So if we look at now some of these, the methyl attached to a CC double bond here. That shows delta value in the range 1.6 to 1.9, note larger than when methyl is attached to an alkyl group. Indeed, the CC double bond is more electron withdrawing than, than an alkyl group. Here we have a methyl attached to an aromatic ring. We can see that the average delta values fall in the range 2.2 .2 to 2.5. This is even larger than the previous value. The aromatic ring is actually more electron withdrawing than a carbon-carbon double bond. These entries show a methyl group attached to a carbonyl group. Note that the chemical shift values are larger than we saw before and that's because the carbonyl group is an electron withdrawing group about the same power as the aromatic ring. A methyl group attached to a nitrogen atom shows delta values in the range 2.2 to 2.6. 
because of the high electronegativity of a nitrogen atom. We'll next look at methyls attached to an oxygen atom. Notice here that the delta values are even larger, basically between 3 and 4 units. This is due to the highly electronegative character of oxygen. The entries in the lower part of the right column are important. Look at this, where the methyl is directly attached to an oxygen, 3.2 to 3.5. Then compare that to this, where the methyl is attached to a methylene, then attached to an oxygen, and so forth. The closer the methyl group is to oxygen, the greater the electron withdrawal effect and the larger the chemical shift value that it shows. The farther away that the methyl group is from the oxygen, the smaller the electron withdrawing effect and the smaller the value of the chemical shift. All right, we're next going to look at entries for methylene protons, and then we'll look at methane protons. But before we do that, I want to make a comparison between the average chemical shifts that are observed for methyl versus methylene versus a methane. So let's return to our table 10.2. The methyl protons were already noted attached to a saturated hydrocarbon show a chemical shift of 0.8 to 1.2 when we have a methylene attached to a saturated hydrocarbon. You'll note that the delta value is a bit larger, 1 to 1.5. We have a methane attached to alkyl groups. It's even larger, 1.4 to 2.0. In a hydrocarbon environment, proceeding from methyl to methylene to methane, we generally find delta values getting larger. This is related to differences in the magnetic field environment of hydrocarbons that have varying degrees of structural branching. I don't want to go into the technicalities here at this point, but it is important to note that this trend does exist. All right, let's look at methylene protons attached to different function groups. When we get on the list, we see that the delta values increase. The situation is pretty much the same as what we saw with the methyl protons. When the methylene is attached, to more electron withdrawing groups, then the corresponding chemical shift values increase. Looking at the methane protons, there aren't very many entries here. We have a methane attached to an aromatic ring, a methane attached to an oxygen, and to three chlorines. It shows that when the methane is attached to electron withdrawing groups that the chemical shift values increase. We now turn our attention to table 10.4. This table gives chemical shifts of protons on unsaturated carbon groups, including alkene, 
alkyne, aromatic, and carbonyl groups. If you look at these values, you notice that they're considerably larger than what we saw in previous tables. This is not due to an electron withdrawing effect of nearby substituents. Instead, it is due to the location of the proton in the magnetic field that's generated by the circulating pi electrons of the unsaturated, that is, pi electron containing group. We'll have more to say about this later. In fact, we talk in detail about this in the part four video. The effect has a fancy name. It's called magnetic anisotropy. So stay tuned for that. Next, we take a look at table 10.5. This table gives the average chemical shifts of protons attached to oxygen, nitrogen, or sulfur. One of the things to notice here is that the observed chemical shift ranges are fairly broad. A carboxyl hydrogen interestingly has a very large delta value of 10 to 12 ppm. All right. The next thing we want to examine is an NMR spectrum for a specific compound, ethyl phenyl acetate. This particular spectrum was generated by a 60 megahertz spectrometer. Our task here is to interpret this NMR spectrum. Now, when your uh, objective is to interpret an NMR spectrum, I recommend doing this first. Determine the number of sets of equivalent protons in the molecule. Each set will correspond to one signal in the spectrum. And when I say signal, I mean not counting any splitting effects. Well, let's take a look. We have the methyl group on the far right that counts as one equivalent set. The methylene attached to it, that's a second set. The other methylene attached to the benzene ring and the carbonyl group, well, that counts as a third set. The benzene ring, we also call the phenyl group, will count as one equivalent set. Technically that's not quite right because the para, meta, and ortho hydrogens of the ring are really not equivalent. However, a 60 megahertz instrument isn't powerful enough to distinguish well between these hydrogens. Now, our total number of equivalent sets of protons is four. One, two, three, four. The important question that we ask is this. Which signals in this NMR spectrum correspond to which sets of protons in the molecule? We're going to use two types of information to help us determine this. We'll use the chemical shift values of the signals, and we'll use signal splitting information. Let's examine chemical shift values as our first step. We'll look first at the ring hydrogens of the phenyl group. 
Let's go back to table 10.4 and find the entry for aromatic protons. Here we are, here we are right here. The indicated delta range is 6 to 9 ppm. Now that's fairly far downfield fairly far on the left end of the NMR spectrum. We note that in our NMR spectrum here, the leftmost signal appears at 7.2 ppm. And that's right in that previously noted range. Remember, 6 to 9 ppm. Therefore, we can say that this signal is caused by the phenyl ring protons. All right, the next look at the methyl group in the molecule. And to get the information on that, we'll turn to table 10.2. Ideally, we'd want to see in our table a methyl attached to methylene and then bonded to an ester oxygen. Let's look at that again. We want to see a methyl attached to methylene attached to an ester oxygen. And in our table, if we examine the structures, well, the table doesn't have that structure exactly. It does have a methyl attached to methylene attached to an ether oxygen. namely right here. We'll take this as a guesstimate. Chemical shift value 1.2 to 1.4. All right, let's return to our spectrum. The signal in our spectrum that comes closest to uh, those values noted 1.2 to 1.4 is here around one part per million. It's a little off, but that's okay. We're just making approximations. So we're going to tentatively say that that this multiplet signal is caused by this methyl. Next we come to the methylene attached to the methyl. Let's go back to our table 10.2 in the methylene section. And see if we can find a matching structure. Here we go, right here. Here we have the methylene attached to a uh, nester oxygen. The indicated delta value 3.7 to 4.1. And going back to our spectrum.
3.7, 4.1. Looks like that agrees with this multiplet signal centered at 4 ppm. So we'll tentatively say that the methylene group here is associated with this multiplet sig signal. Next we come to the remaining methylene group in the molecule. Now this is going to be a little bit more difficult to estimate its delta value because it's bonded to two different functional groups, a phenyl group and the carbonyl of an ester group. If we go back to our our table, the methylene section, we won't find that specific structure in our tables. However, there is a procedure that we can use that will give us a reasonable guesstimate. What we're going to do is first find the delta value for methylene attached to a phenyl group and that would be right here 2.5 to 2.9 We'll take the value right in the middle, 2.7. Remember that, 2.7. Then we'll take the methylene bonded to a carbonyl group. Well, unfortunately, we don't see that. So we're going to do the next best thing and look for a structural en uh, entry in the table that's at least similar, if not identical, to our molecule. We do find a methylene group attached to a carbonyl group of a ketone. Right here. The range we see is 2.3 to 2.7. So it's, the structure is a little off, but uh, again, we're dealing with estimates. The value in the middle of this range is 2.5. Now, to review, we, we have, value, have a value 2.7 for the methylene attached to an aromatic ring, the phenyl group, and then we have the value of the methylene that's attached to a carbonyl group, 2.5. Now, what I do procedurally is this. I'll write down those two values, 2.7 methylene attached to phenyl group, 2.5 methylene attached to a carbonyl group. You can look at these two values. We'll take the larger of the two, the 2.7. Then we're going to add the effect of the other, but we're not going to add literally the 2.5. Instead, we'll take the 2.5, divide it by 2, and it gives us 1.25. And we add these two values together, and we come up with 3.95. That's going to be our a guesstimate for the chemical shift for that methylene attached to phenyl and carbonyl group. So returning to our spectrum, 3.95. Oh my, we note that there's obviously an ambiguity here. Our estimate of the delta value for the other methylene, the one here, was 4. The estimated chemical shift values for the two are too close to really distinguish them. So, 
what we will do is distinguish them by examining this signal splitting effects in the spectrum. That is, we're going to go to part two as we interpret the spectrum. So we're going to do just that. We're going to examine the signal splitting pattern. Okay, look at the methyl group in the molecule. We note that it has a methylene that neighbors it. That counts as two equivalent neighboring hydrogens. We use our n plus one rule the methyl signal should be split into a triplet. 2 plus 1 equals 3. Indeed in our spectrum we have this triplet and that agrees with our what we uh, determined from our chemical shift analysis that this signal is associated with the methyl. Our splitting analysis confirms that. We see that this methyl should be split into a triplet by the methylene. Indeed it is. All right. Now we next look at the methylene here in terms of the splitting pattern associated with it. This methylene has methyl hydrogens that neighbor it. That's three equivalent neighboring hydrogens. We use our n plus one rule and take three plus one and we get voila four. In other words splitting analysis indicates that this methylene should be split into four piglets a quartet. This allows us now to distinguish between this methylene group and this methylene group. This methylene group is expected to show a quartet so we're going to associate this quartet signal with this methylene. Now the other methylene, let's look at what's going on with it in terms of the, the splitting that we might see for it. Well, we look for neighboring hydrogens. There's no neighboring hydrogens on that carbon and there's really none there. In other words, this methylene has no neighboring hydrogens. It's not going to be split. It should be a singlet. Well, our singlet the only singlet we have that's uh, close in the estimated uh, chemical shift value is here, about 3.6. So we as ascribe this signal, the singlet signal, to this methylene. All right, that in fact should complete our an analysis. Now the only thing that remains with respect to analyzing the NMR spectrum of our compound is the peak integration results. The relative heights of the stair step lines tells us the relative number of protons in each equivalent set. The stair step heights are not given here, but they should be in the following ratio. 5 for the 5 ring hydrogens to 2 for the methylene hydrogens here to two for the 
other methylene hydrogens to three for the three methyl protons. This appears to be approximately correct. I now want to take another look at signal splitting. With respect to proton-proton splitting, let's ask some basic questions. 1. How close do protons have to be to be considered neighboring protons? 2. What is the magnitude of the splitting that we see when two neighboring protons couple? When I say magnitude of the splitting, I mean the gap or distance between two adjacent peaklets in a split signal. The best way to measure this gap is by measuring the difference in the frequencies of adjacent peaklets in the multiplet signal. This frequency difference is called the magnitude of the splitting. It is referred to as the coupling constant. We use the symbol J, capital J, for this. Let's turn to a new table. This table gives the magnitude of some typical coupling constants. As we examine entries in this table, one of the most basic features we discover is this. Although there are exceptions, the closer two coupling protons are in a molecule, the larger their coupling constant. On adjacent carbons, coupling constant falls in the range of 6 to 8 or in this situation 5 to 7. When two coupling protons are on the same carbon and you would most often see this situation when that's a part of a cyclic system, a ring, the coupling constant is relatively large, 12 to 15 Hertz. Now there is something else that deserves comment. Research has shown that the communication between two coupling protons is not a through space phenomenon, but rather it's an effect that operates through the chain of bonding electrons that connects the protons. Thank you for your attention.